second we continue tonight. We started last week. The word in your outline is priority, having the right priority. And remember, we were looking at why Paul wanted to go back to the churches he had planted in Galatia. Did you find a, a map of Galatia for me? Did I ask you for one? Can you look for one online, please? Uh, just look at Paul's second missionary journey. So Paul wanted to go back. First of all, we said because he had a special love for his own spiritual children. All right? And that's reflected in his writings as he writes to the churches that he, he founds, if you will. And secondly, he went back because, beloved, Paul was committed to discipleship. In your outline, the word is discipleship. And you might remember that I commented that discipleship is often an ingredient of evangelism that is le left out. And you know, if you don't learn anything about evangelism, anything else, learn this. The best way for you to evangelize is to reproduce one, uh, or for you to produce one reproducing disciple. At least one reproducing disciple. And Paul knew that with his running around, he was creating spiritual infants here and there in a lot of different places. And he was leaving, as he left a lot of those towns, with great regret oftentimes. He left behind spiritual babies that were lying on their back screaming. Okay? And he always knew that he needed to be about maturing them enough to reproduce. And I think I could say that he would feel that it would be better <coughs> to spend yourselves on some individuals that might, in fact, become mature and that might carry on the gospel themselves. We often think of Paul in these big, magnificent, wonderful missionary trips, and they were wonderful trips. But I'm going to try to show you as the evening progresses how Paul liked to go back and back and back again to the same place. You know, Jesus, today we started speaking of the, the feeding of the 5,000, but Jesus oftentimes didn't speak to real big crowds. People were always following him around. But who did he major on? Yeah. He majored on his disciples, okay? He spent most of his time with 12 disciples in one-on-one, -on -one, one or two, one or three type teaching. And that's really the heart of evangelism. He was committed to the priority of maturing believers. Paul wrote in Ephesians, he said, and he, speaking of Jesus, has given some apostles for the perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting has the idea of maturing behind it. He knew that his place was to build up believers. And as I said, you know, we think about the, Paul's three great missionary journeys and of him carrying out the gospel to the heathens, okay? But you, where did he go on his first missionary journey? Galatia, okay? Remember that? I've told you that. And where did he go on his second missionary journey? Galatia. He went other places too, but he went to Galatia. I'll show you some things about that this evening. And do you know where he went on his third missionary journey? You can look in Acts 18, 23. It says after he had spent some time there, he departed. He went over the region of Galatia. And Phrygia in order strengthening, strengthening the disciples. Kind of like a broken record going back to the same place. You might think, well, hasn't he heard of other places? Yeah, he has. Paul had great plans, great grandiose plans. The Lord didn't f work all those through him as he might have desired, but did great work through him. But he, off he went back to Galatia three different times, and we know that ultimately the effective way then to evangelize is to reproduce. Reproducing Christians, and babies do not reproduce. 
And that's one of the problems with a modern American church. There's a whole bunch of babies in the congregation that haven't grown up in the Lord and are scared to people to talk to talk to people about Jesus. See, the demise of the church in America is only one source, the church. And I believe, and this is my own personal opinion, but I believe that in today's climate, in the long run, the faithful teaching work of a local church can have just as great an effect in evangelism than all the evangelistic crusades that come from the outside that you might want to bring in. Now, I do believe that God uses evangelistic crusades. I believe he uses revivals. I've taken part in uh, dozens of revivals over the years. But I really believe what greatly multiplies the effectiveness of the gospel is one-on-one evangelism. And Paul saw that. If you look in Colossians 1.28, he expressed it in this term. He said, him, meaning Christ, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man, there's the same word again, perfect in Christ Jesus. Worked hard to bring people to maturity. Colossians 4, 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. He understood what the point was. You get a group of built up saints and they can be very productive. And Paul said to the Colossians, I want you to be rooted in Jesus, built in Jesus, established in the faith. And when he got ready to leave, uh, when he closed his letter, he commended them to the word of God's grace, which is able to build you up. Always the idea of building up. And it's wonderful just to focus on it, isn't it? You meet this man, Paul, who has such a passion for evangelism, and you're outlining the word as passion, but he never allowed his passion to run ahead of his priority. Again, is the second word there in your outline. You know, you can imagine somebody that's so passionate, and Paul was a very passionate man, who could have lost the sense of his priorities, who might just just run around all over the world leading people to the Lord and just leaving them. But he was a nurturer, a nurturer. Even with his passion, he was still sensitive to the leading of the Spirit. He knew his priorities, and he had a right priority to go with his right passion. All right? Comments on passion or priority? Point number three. The third thing I want to point out to you in the work of evangelism is the right personnel. The right personnel. The basis of evangelism is a right passion and a right priority, which is discipleship. We've determined that. But it also demands the right personnel, and we're going to see that very illustrated in these next few verses. God had special people for special tasks. Remember I've told you God uses people that are on the go. He does. He is not in the business of dusting people up off the shelf. He uses people whose wheels are turning. And we're going to see some special people here in a very interesting circumstance. Look at verse 37 in our source text in Acts 15. Here's how God chooses or chose the right personnel. Barnabas determined to take with them John. That word determined in the Greek is in, written in the imperfect tense and it means he consistently, persistently determined. In your outline the word is persisted. He wouldn't back off. He wanted to take with them John called Mark. And Barnabas and Paul had made a deal. They were ready to go off to Galatia and Barnabas said, I want to take John Mark. I want to take John Mark. I want to take John Mark. That's what that word means in the Greek. He was persistent. He kept saying it over and over. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, what had John Mark done? They 
took him one other time, didn't they? They took him on the first missionary trip, and what did he do? Well, he, he got up there to uh, Pamphylia and took a look at those mountains, very, very intimidating mountains, and all the stories he heard, you know, those mountains were notorious for being very hard to travel through and lots of robbers. And he took a look at the situation. Maybe he wasn't happy with the situation with Paul and Barnabas. Maybe he thought Paul, uh, Paul was taking supremacy over Barnabas. Whatever the circumstance might be, maybe he was a little jealous of Barnabas. I don't know. But maybe it would seem that the glamour of the missionary service was wearing off. And what did he do in chapter 13, verse 13? He turned back and went home. Now we all know about Barnabas. Barnabas was a, a, a loving guy, right? He was an encourager. He, was a, he liked to restore people from what we understand. And what do we know about John Mark? Was John Mark a bad guy? No, not really. He was the son of the lady in whose house, uh, after the prayer meeting, after, when, when Peter we got out of jail, they had a prayer meeting at his mother's house. He's the author of the Gospel of Mark, so he's not a slouch. She comes from a good family. God really used him. But Paul didn't want to take him around because I think Paul thought he was dead weight. And he didn't have confidence in him. So verse 38 says, But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them. That word departed has a very, very definitive meaning in the Greek. We get the word apostasy from it. So Paul's not saying that John Mark was a theological apostate. I don't think John, uh, Paul was saying that John Mark was a doctrinal apostate. I do think he was saying John Mark was a service apostate in his mind. So uh, what would be the picture of that? The picture of that would be putting your hand on the plow and looking back. Not keeping your eye on the prize, okay? So he had departed from them in Pamphylia and had gone with them to the work. Now was Paul a strong man? <clears throat> Shake your head yes. Was he persistent? Shake your head yes. And it's hard for strong, persistent people to tolerate what they see in other people as weakness. Was Paul a courageous man? Yes, he was. And it's very hard for courageous people to tolerate, tolerate what they might see as cowardice. So Paul said, nope, I'm not taking a guy who went with us once and turned his back on that trip. And I kind of feel sorry for Barnabas. We see old Barnabas, lovering Barnabas, encouraging, exhorting Barnabas. He's a good guy, strong, and he doesn't want to bow down in regards. He, I want to take John Mark. And Paul says no. So what happened? They had an argument. Verse 39, then the contention became, what's your Bible say? Sharp. Sharp, a sharp contention. And what did they then do? They parted from one another. It doesn't say that they shook hands, they put their arms around each other, they gave each other a, a hug and said, bless you, brother. We're going to go do what we need to do. You go do what you're going to do. What it says is that they departed one from another. And uh, there is a very, very strong inference in the Greek of quite a contention between the two of them. Uh, that word that's used, that, uh, that they parted from one another, uh, that's only used one other time in the New Testament. Revelation 6, 14 speaks of the, uh, the disaster of the heavens being departed. <laughs> Pretty dramatic. So when they departed, they departed. There wasn't a lot of love there. I imagine there was some bitterness there. Do Christians get bitter with each other? Sure do. They blasted off in two directions, and Barnabas took Paul, and where'd they go? They went home. Barnabas went home to the island of Cyprus. Spent six months in Cyprus, Cyprus once. And that was home for Barnabas. That's where he came from, and Barnabas and Mark went to Cyprus to 
continue their ministry there. And we see Barnabas was committed to the same thing Paul was committed to, wasn't he? What did he do when he went back to Cyprus? He discipled saints, people that they had already helped lead find the Lord. That was the, their priority. So they went off, went off, and you might ask the question, well, who was sinful here? That's a hard question to answer. I will say this, the contention was very sharp. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Somebody read that for me. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Anybody? Does not be a ruby, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and no evil. So Paul, an advocate of love, found himself in a confrontation where things were sharp. And Paul must have reminisced about the battle he had with Barnabas. Who was right? Was Barnabas right? Was Paul right? This is what does the scripture say? Does it say who was right? So that means I'll have to give you my opinion. If you want, don't, if you want my opinion, and I'm going to give you my opinion even if you don't want my opinion. So here's my opinion. I side with Paul. And I dearly love Barnabas. And my heart goes out to him in this situation. And I'm glad he was a restoring type of guy. I think that's what he was trying to do with John Mark. And if ever, all the evidence is that John Mark was restored. And I believe God used him with Mark. But I think Paul was right here. And here's some reasons why I think he was right. And these are my reasons. So you can take, take them for what they're worth. Number one, Paul had apostolic authority over Bonham. To me, that is very important. Paul had apostolic authority over Barnabas. And I feel as Barnabas was the true man he should have been at that moment, he would have submitted to that authority. Paul was an apostle. Are there apostles today? No, there are not. Not in the sense that there was then. They had special authority. And this is an issue. I believe that authority in the church is very, very important. Churches produce documents that they say they're going to live by, and then they never live by them. Churches issue, issue uh, creeds and uh, covenants and et cetera, et cetera, and they say they're going to live by them, and they never live by them. And that's one of the problems in our churches today. And this is an issue. Authority in the church is very, very important. And Paul was, in terms of Christ, the one who stood next to Christ, and Barnabas then stood underneath them. So I think there should have been submission. Reason one. Reason two, in the end, because I believe in the sovereignty of God, this is important, in the end, what happened? Did Mark go with Paul? No. no. Mark went with Barnabas. That was God's sovereignty at work. And it seems to me that when the plan of God that Mark that would have been the plan originally. If Barnabas had never stepped in, that would have been a, the plan originally. Now, of course, all of this had to be in the framework of God's plan. But God did not plan for Mark to go with Paul. And so perhaps uh, Barnabas was truly out of line by trying to bring Mark along or desiring to bring him along. Reason number two, God's sovereignty. Third reason, verse 40. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren of the grace to the grace of God. The church definitely recognized the due of Paul and Silas, and perhaps they had the mind of the Spirit on that, and they, they commended them, but does it say anything about Barnabas and Mark being commended? Was Barnabas a prominent member of the church? Yes, he was, but he was not commended by the church. And when you read verse 39, there is the inference in the, in the writings that they hustled off to Cyprus. They weren't comfortable. They went quickly to Cyprus. And then fourth thing, I feel in my own mind that it was a lot better for Mark to go with Barnabas 
than it would have been for him to go along with Paul, because I think Paul would have made it a rough trip. I think it would have been tough on Mark to go with Paul at that particular no moment when he knew that Paul didn't want him to go, didn't trust him to go. To go. So I think the, the Spirit worked it out and worked it out beautifully. Now, and that's my opinion for what, what it's worth. And you can deal with it in your own mind however you desire to. Anyway, they took off. And I want you to remember this. Later on, Barnabas, in 1 Corinthians 9, 6, was commended by Paul. Paul mentions there, having no continuing animosity, not at all, but uh, Paul commends Barnabas in 1 Corinthians 9. And Paul absolutely loved Mark. When Paul was in, in a Roman jail, he wrote to Timothy, and he said, Timothy, come and be with me. Demas has deserted me. He's forsaking me, loving the present world. And Luke alone is with me now. By the way, when you come, would you bring Mark to me because he is profitable for me. That's restoration. That's how you restore people. That's the loving heart of Paul. So Barnabas did a good job with Mark. Mark was welcomed back. Okay, He wrote the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark was a, a very close companion to Peter. 1 Peter 5.13 indicates so. And in fact, many commentarians believe that a lot of the information contained in the Gospel of Mark comes from Peter. Okay? That Peter may have been instrumental in the writing of that Gospel as the Holy Spirit used Mark to write the Gospel. So it's a comforting passage when you think of it. There's an art. Am I? <laughs> it's kind of comforting when you think about it to know that the early church had problems too. Have you been at a church lately that has no problems? We don't have very many, but churches almost always have some problems. In your outline, the word is problems. So it's wonderful that know, to know that Paul and Barnabas were human. It's also nice to know that they forgave each other and re were restored to each other. And you can see again how the Holy Spirit worked through this process. Satan tried to build a rift between these missionaries. And what happened? Well, instead of having one missionary team, we ended up with two missionary teams. Verse 40, Paul chose Silas, and he departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. The church commended those two. And we met Silas a little while ago. Silas, chapter 15, verse 32, is declared to be a prophet. Earlier in 27 and 22, he's mentioned as he's sent to the church in Antioch from the church in Jerusalem to substantiate the letter that is delivered to the church in Antioch. They wanted some personal witnesses as to the authenticity of the letter. So they, they sent Paul, uh, uh, Silas, and Judas, okay? Two disciples from Jerusalem. So Silas was a prophet, and God had uh, him in store to accompany Paul. And I want you to look at something else really beautiful. This is, these are the perfect choices. In your outline, God chooses the right people for the right job. Let me tell you, if you're going to go romping around in the Roman Empire, it's very helpful to be a Roman citizen. Silas, we know from Scripture, was a Roman citizen. Perfect. If you're going to be going around to towns and uh, stopping off at synagogues, it's helpful to be a, a Jew. <coughs> Silas was a Jewish Roman citizen. If you're going to be announcing the message that the Jerusalem church had established salvation by grace, it's nice if you happen to be from the Jerusalem church. And Silas was. And if you're going to be preaching and proclaiming, it's nice that you be a prophet. And Silas was, in fact, in many ways, God had the right man for the right job, and his name was Silas. In fact, if you look in the 16th chapter, when they just get to, got to Philippi and the whole thing fell apart, you might remember if you look at 1635, 
there's a deal with a jailer and all that stuff, and God brought an earthquake and the whole thing. Well, when the, the next day came the magistrate, that's the, the head honchos in town, they sent their sergeants, because they're not the head honchos in town, they were passing the buck, and they said, let those men go, let them out of jail. And the keeper of the pr prison told Paul that, and what did Paul say? <coughs> well, the, the keeper said, the magistrates have sent, sent to let you go, not to part in peace. And Paul said, ain't no way. He said to them, you've beaten us openly. We are uncondemned at being Romans, and you have cast us into prison. Speaking of them himself and Silas, they had violated their rights as Roman citizens to a fair trial. And now, you, and now do they thrust us out secretly or privately. They wanted to get rid of them so nobody would know what they had done wrong. But is Paul going to let those guys off the hook? No. Uh, not Paul. <laughs> what he says is, tell them to come get us. Tell them to come get us out. Strong character. And the sergeants go back and they get the big wheels and the big wheels have to come down there. And the big wheels, they're, they're, they're scared to death and they come down and they actually plead with them to leave. Get out of jail, get out of town. All is forgiven. So was it important to be a Roman? Yes, it was. And God knew all the features of Silas about the culture, the background, all these things. He picked the right man for the right job in the right place. Back in our source scripture, chapter 15, verse 41, they went through Syria and Cilicia, okay? And just to give you an idea, ah, oh, there you go. That's not bad, I think. Can you see that? Is there any way to make, there you go. Let me see. So, uh, most people think the second missionary uh, trip would have started down in Jerusalem, down south, down there, Jerusalem. They come up, oh, man, they just went out into the middle of the sea. It was amazing. They come up and they go up through. They have the big meeting in Antioch where they tell them salvation is still, or salvation is by grace only, all right? Then they go up through Tarsus. Here they go through the Well, the Tarsus Mountains are over yonder. These are called the Cilician Towers, I believe. Right here you have Cilicia, okay? That's a name you've read often, okay? And then they go to Derby, and they go to Lystra, and they go to Iconium. Those are all familiar names, right? Why? Because they went there on their first trip, right? That's where they were, that's where they were ending their ministry in the first trip. And then they go up through here, and they go up through Asia. Come on around. Okay. Go up through here. They go through all of these. There, is that Philippi right there? There's Philippi. Okay. They come down through Thessaloniki. These are all the churches that they're, they're birthing as they go along. Okay. And then they come, up, they come down through here. They come back across the Aegean Sea to Ephesus. And then they head on back down, and we get back. They go, but do they go to the Cyprus? No. Don't need to go to Cyprus. Why? Because the other guys are there. They don't need to go to Cyprus. They head back down to Jerusalem. Okay? So, uh, and, I want, uh, and it's very important to understand what's important about the way they went. Okay? So, with Jerusalem, they go up, they go up through Antioch, they go through uh, Cilicia, they go through Syria, and they're preaching, and the gospel that started in Jerusalem spread north, goes through these lands, and in verse 41, they went through Syria, Cilicia, doing what? What does it say they did in verse 41? Confirming. Some uh, versions will say confirming, because remember the Judaizers ran around behind them all the time, saying, well, you need to get circumcised, you need to be you need to adhere to the, the law of Moses. So they're reconfirming. That's why Paul wrote his letter to Galatia to confirm to them salvation by grace. 
And it comes, remember we looked at that word strengthening or confirming, it comes from the word styrix in the, in the Greek, it means to prop them up. They went around propping people up, okay? Strengthening churches, building up the saints, and they knew the priorities with strong saints, they'll reproduce. In your outline, the words are babies don't have babies. Adults do. You need mature Christians. So here they are ministering, strengthening, confirming the saints, and then watch this. They're ready to take off, and now where are they going to go? They go they're going to go to Galatia. Where did they go last time? Last time, the first place they went was to Cyprus, remember? To the island, and they crossed from the southeast to the northwest, right diagonally across the island of Cyprus. Okay? Barnabas... Uh, uh, but Barnabas and Mark are there now, so they don't have to worry about going that way. No sense in going that way. Okay, so they're going to go backwards. Okay, the Holy Spirit has laid their travel itinerary all out. Do you know why? Because they're going to cross, cross through, they're called the Cilician Gates. Right there in Cilicia. Before you get to Derby, there's this large mountain range where you have to pass through this area called the Cilician Gate. It's very hard to get through. Massive mountains. And they climb through that area. And they get up onto that plateau where uh, Derby and uh, uh, Iconium are and those other three, those three set of three cities. And uh, if they had gone the other way, like they did on the first trip, those would have been the last place they went, right? Okay. But this time they're the first place. You know why that's very, very, very important. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Where did they? They went to Derby, Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, and his name was Timothy. And Timothy got to go on on the job training. In the Air Force, we called it OJT. <laughs> Now, if they had gone the other way, would he have had that opportunity for training? No. But he got to go on this entire trip with them. This disciple of Timothy. So you can see, all along, through all of this interaction between all these different personalities and men, God had a plan to add another team member to Paul's missionary team, a man named Timothy. If they had gone the other way, they wouldn't have got to him until the tour was almost over. Amen? God is perfect. You're perfect. Questions? Comments? Anybody? So how long was it? Huh? How long did it take him to go all the way? Oh, I don't know. If I told you, I'd be guessing right now. Al, do you know how long this trip took? No. Yeah, I'd be guessing. Two weeks. It took quite a while. It was not easy. Because they had to walk a lot, right? Yeah. 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 Very perilous. And a lot of these places where you have to go through the mountains and stuff, that's where the robbers set up to rob people that are trying to get through there. So a very perilous journey. So. I'm just fascinated by this how God knew exactly how to set up everything for the success of the early church. No matter what the circumstance might have been. Hello? Yes. <laughs> I didn't get there yet. What is it? Yeah, half Gentile, half Jew. I didn't, get, I didn't finish my lesson tonight. So I give him the answers? No, because I'm going to give them to him next week. Okay. We'll start there next week. All right? Yeah, you guys are... Boy, you know, if you guys were in school, you'd be in trouble right now. I'd be sending you to the principal. I was the principal. <laughs> you get a star. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, he was well-spoken. He was spoken. He was... Well spoken of, yes. which is typical 
of elders. Elders are well spoken of. Questions, comments? Anybody? Well, I hardly ever, I hardly ever use Google as my source for, uh, yeah, probably four or five months. Yes, Margaret. I was going to tell a story. Yeah. Shack.